the last thing I talked about yesterday was the reflection, the called the um, knowledge, the contemplation of reflection. And this contemplation of reflection is uh, part of the um, desire for deliverance. So the the desire for deliverance comes about because we can keep on reflecting about these three characteristics. And I've talked about them already quite a bit. And it is like the thread that goes through the whole of the teaching as wherever there is insight there is the or insight mentioned those three are meant and essentially then it all boils down to the third one to non-self or substancelessness or corelessness that's what it all boils down to in the end and it boils down to the experience of that and it boils down to the feeling of it. The whole thing is feeling. We can think and think and think, but we need to understand with the mind, but eventually we'll have to feel it. So what we have in this aspect of reflection is again going over anything that comes to our attention whether we breathe or think or walk or sit or move are those three characteristics involved it is easier to pick one to pick one and actually try to penetrate that one and it doesn't matter which one but one thing that one has to remember one cannot penetrate something that isn't there so to penetrate non-self is not a useful endeavor to try and find self yes because obviously we think it's there and the more we try to find it the more we will probably wind up recognizing the fact that it's not to be found. (coughs) But we can't look for something that doesn't exist. We can only look for something that we think exists and then come to the final experience of that it was a mistaken view. So whichever one we look for, whether we are looking for impermanence or whether we look at, the dukkha involved in everything that we experience, by this time, none of, by this time in this progression, none of that creates any disturbance in the mind. All of it is seen so objectively that dukkha no longer means that one becomes unhappy. Dukkha means seeing things as they really are. It's an inner in inner connection to the reality of this constant change. And that inner connection to that constant change, and here we look at it from moment to moment, that inner connection realizes then this is never satisfying. This cannot be because it's always moving. So this is our desire for deliverance and the reflection brings about the next step. And the next step is sometimes called, as it is in here, equanimity about formations. It's a bit of a cumbersome ex, uh, expression and it comes out of the commentary and the Buddha called it dispassion which is um, easier and also when we look at the root words in Pali we can see that it is uh, the meaning behind it in Pali it's called viraga now vi, vi 
is again a syllable for non. Just as ah, a syllable, just the a means non. And V also means non. And Raga is raging. The same, same, exactly the same word. It's that raging inside of wanting and not wanting. And when that is stopped, we get V Raga, we get dispassion. It has nothing to do with loving. Passion and loving are not the same thing. And it has nothing to do with indifference. It is equanimity. And equanimity strictly arising out of insight. Now when I was explaining to you the um, fourth jhana, I told you that it's sometimes called equanimity. But actually, the reality of it is that although that could be experienced, the experience is so minimal that equanimity arises out of that experience. Never to be confused with indifference. Indifference is non-feeling. The first syllable already says that. I-N means non. That's the syllable for non. So it's not indifference at all. But equanimity arises out of fourth jhana, but it has to be supported by insight. Otherwise, it cannot com- become complete. Equanimity is the inner realization which does not leave that everything is constantly moving, that nothing is of such significance that one could possibly be perturbed about it. That there is nothing in the world that needs grasping and clinging because nothing has intrinsic value. It's all moving. And that grasping and clinging only brings dukkha. And that all the dukkha we've ever had has come from that. And that inner realization, which has come about through that pathway which we have had, can be again and again reflected upon. Now the pathway, this is the eighth insight, this equanimity, the dispassion. Either word is fine, the dispassion or equanimity about formation, everything that's formed also mental formations, of course. Again and again, we can go over this pathway which one has come in order to get to that eighth one, eighth step and refurbish within oneself that understanding. So the very first step was seeing that mind and body are two and that the mind's in charge, that it's always the mind. And the second one, that we saw rising and ceasing in its constant movement, but also in its generality. And the third one, that we saw cause and effect, which has three aspects, karma and its resultants, the mind arising out of the sense consciousness or the sense contact and the body being con- uh, consisting of the elements, the coming together of the elements as causes. And then looking at the three characteristics, picking one and getting a feel for it getting a feel for impermanence, getting a feel for it through the meditation subject and through the mind that's looking at the meditation subject. And having seen that quite clearly, moment to moment. Now this is a difference that we can see first, arising and ceasing 
in its generality and also as it comes and as it goes and comes and goes. But eventually we can see it in every moment. In every moment that the mind has, in every moment that a movement has, anything that happens all the time, there is this impermanence, which means dukkha. And from that we see the dissolution, how everything falls away, disappears. And from that comes, not always, but often, um, particularly for non-jhana meditators, terror, the fear, everything is falling apart, and then seeing the danger, the danger in this not satisfying existing existence that we have. It doesn't have anything to really fulfill us. And from that comes disenchantment. And having come as far as that, being disenchanted with the world, desire for deliverance, and reflection again. And the reflection and the desire for deliverance together bring a certain composure in the mind. It doesn't get into states of extremes. The emotional mind, <coughs> which is prone to emotionalism, goes into extremes. It goes way down and often gets attached to it being so full of dukkha, but doesn't see the generality of dukkha, the universality of it, but just <clears throat> feels very sorry for itself and being down at the bottom finds it hard to come up again but having the opposite effect of acceleration which is a high and then a low and then anywhere in between all that and most minds in the world do that from high to low and then somewhere three quarters and then a quarter up and then all the way up and then all the way down again. And when the mind is all the way up, it gets terribly excited and everything is important. And when the mind is way down, it denies everything and rejects everything and everything is bad and nothing can be, can be of any use. So both are such extremes that there is no way of seeing truth. So the, the ability to see that there's nothing else to be done in this world except to get delivered from all this and to reflect again and again on this pathway of insight brings the composure in the mind, which is part of equanimity. Maybe the mind isn't totally equanimous, but at least it's composed. It is composed enough to investigate. And to investigate with all its faculties. Now, all of us have the intelligence to investigate. But the minute we are under the influence of emotion, that faculty is totally impaired. We don't know anything anymore. All we know is the emotion. And the emotion is one of two. Either we reject and resist, or we want and want to keep. So it's either one or the other. With those two emotions, the whole inside pathway is blocked. Life is rather difficult. Dukkha could be seen quite clearly, but isn't, because one thinks at that time it's somebody's fault. And if one can't find anybody other than oneself whose fault it is, then one is, then it's one's own fault. So we are blaming. Whether we're blaming others or ourselves, it really makes no difference. It's just another negative mental formation to blame. Instead of having the composed mind, due to the seven steps of insight which we have taken, and this composed mind is Another word for it is objective. It's an objective mind. 
it sees things objectively as if it was as if one is one's own maybe one's own mirror or the one's like a bystander like standing next to oneself and looking at oneself and seeing what's going on now obviously if one is a bystander to oneself and just looks what's going on one doesn't have to get all upset about it it's just happening and if one has any clue that anicca dukkha and atta are universal and that dukkha is totally universal and that it doesn't mean suffering it just means being unfulfilled and not having what one really wants and not getting what one really wants because one can't in the world and sees this quite objectively the mind remains composed it's aware of feeling but it doesn't give in to emotion now the difference between equanimity and indifference is worlds apart and it has to be known quite clearly because indifference is another extreme it's another extreme of protecting oneself from imaginary attacks so it's a total extreme but having gone through seven stages of insight at this time the mind is naturally composed that doesn't mean that it can't enjoy it's got nothing to do with that it can enjoy without being attached it doesn't have to cling to the enjoyment nor does it have to crave it it can objectively see it so the composed mind <coughs> is the third aspect the path for deliverance is one reflection on all the past insights particularly on anicca dukkha anatta and composure together make this passion or one can call it equanimity it doesn't matter which one it is this is as the eighth step of insight the one which is at the verge of the past moment which we will eventually talk about but that brings one actually to the rim where one can take the step to the other side and it shows itself also in one's daily reactions because at that time there seems to be already a great purity this purity is unfortunately not at that time not not yet um established as an inner reality but it is established through the meditation and through the reflection upon the insights now every time meditation takes place any kind of concentration any time contemplation or investigation upon any of the insights takes place purification is established and that's why quite often people find that after they've heard some dhamma they can meditate better they also find that it will help them at the beginning of a meditation to recollect any of the dhamma steps that they have fully understood have digested within have become imbued with completely to just recollect them it helps because the purity of the mind which is established because of that is of such a nature that concentration is easier 
So at this time, the, con- the purity of mind is there, but not as a completely established factor, but only as a result of meditation and Dhamma um, reflection. But with that, with that purity of mind, the understanding the insight into the not satisfactory nature of the world can be easily established. See, when the mind has a lot of wanting or a lot of disliking, how can it see that the world hasn't got it? Because one wants what the world has or one dislikes what the world has. So there's no way of knowing that there's nothing in the world that can ever either let go of what we don't want, dukkha, or give us what we want. So there has to be that purity already established. Now purity is established through meditation, any concentration, particularly the jhanas, through mindfulness, through constant substitution. Through constant substitution of the negative with the positive. Over and over and over. And these negativities are one of the greatest obstacles for meditation because they do not allow the mind to expand to the point where it doesn't hang on to anything. See, if one dislikes something, one's obviously stuck to it. Otherwise, one wouldn't be disliking it. If it's all gone, well, what's there to, what's there to think about? So if one is stuck to something one dislikes, the mind doesn't have that flow, it doesn't have the expansiveness that it needs to see the uh, truth same as liking something, one's even more stuck maybe. But that's not so. It appears to be as if one is more stuck to what one likes than what one dislikes, but that's not true at all. One is just as stuck to the dislikes as to the likes. And some people have more of the dislikes and so they're just as stuck. Because how could one not be? The minute one isn't stuck anymore, one doesn't dislike it anymore. It's all gone. So the, um, the clinging is the same on both levels, whether it's hate or greed. And also, interestingly enough, a person who has more greed than hate often is inclined to think that this is um, worse than, uh, than disliking because they always find something new to want. But the one who dislikes always finds something new to dislike. Mm -hmm. And most of it is absurd. But then the one who wants something, most of it's absurd too. (laughs) In order to see that, one's got to be totally objective. No longer subjective towards oneself. And not to be subjected towards oneself means one's already let go of a lot of that ego illusion. Because otherwise one is constantly subjective. So it, to have this particular point happening means that the insight has become very strong of it. And again, as I, as you know and from the teaching that you have had that with the jhanas, it's much easier. To do this without a jhana is a Herculean job. How anybody can do it, it's uh, admirable. Because the, the, um, the suppression even just of the defilements is so difficult without having that helpmate of natural um, progression of that, that it becomes a job which is really um, probably beyond most people's ability. 
So if nothing else, the jhanas need to be practiced for purification. Never mind what else they bring. If you've forgotten everything else that they bring, for purification. And with the purification, the insight is possible. Without that purification, it can't be seen. It is like a dirty mirror or a dirty window. Let's say there's a dirty window where we can't see outside. We don't know what's going on out there. It's all full of uh, um, steam or even uh, writing. We can't see a thing. When we've cleaned it up, we can see. So the word purification does um, fit the situation very well. Equanimity is the highest of all emotions. It's one of the seven factors of enlightenment. Love and compassion are not factors of enlightenment. Love and compassion are practice paths. A factor of enlightenment is equanimity. And the, this insight moment here, this insight path moment, it's not uh, just a moment, this needs this practice, um, is again based on this particular emotion. Now when we hear the word emotion, we usually think of something that has ups and downs. Equanimity doesn't have that. Equanimity is something quite stable and has a stabilizing effect. It has a stabilizing effect on oneself and one's surroundings. And the clear insight into the moment-to-moment impermanence is the most important factor for arousing equanimity. Because if we can see how everything constantly falls apart, that there is nothing at all that remains except some very distorted memory, what is there possibly to be upset about? What is there possibly to worry about? What is there possibly to be restless about? What is there possibly to want? Or to not want? What could there be? It's all falling apart constantly. Now, equanimity as the highest of the emotions arises out of the fourth jhana, out of insight, but also out of a deliberate attempt to see again and again whether any of the emotionalism that one is engaged in brings any good results. Now, emotionalism is that kind of reaction which has either the high or the low in it. And as I said before, it prevents all clarity. Emotionalism also shows itself in tension, in stress, in, um, in a lot of the dislikes that seem to be so petty, but are all part of the impurity which prevents real seeing. Together with this dispassion also comes another reflection. Because this is a very important aspect, and if you remember, I told you about the jhanas, always make a recapitulation, how did you get in, so that you can do it again. Well, it's the same with insight. If an insight has arisen, and every intelligent person knows when they've had an insight. Reflect. Does this hold true under all circumstances? Or is this only true for 
a certain situation. If it is only true for a certain situation, it's not an insight. Insight has to be universal. It's got to be true for everyone all the time. So if anything arises which is true insight, reflect. Reflect on it whether this would mean it can be used under all circumstances and by everyone. And if that is so, it's true. Then you can be quite sure it's true. The necessity to check on our own insights is always lies always the always lies with us. We have to be able to discern whether we are seeing truth or not. It's very easy to be deluded. It's not as easy to see the truth. So again and again, check it out. Is it true for everybody? Will it be true under all circumstances? And if it's only true for one certain situation, it has nothing to do with absolute truth. The difference between insight and just problem solving is relative truth and absolute truth. Relative truth is that what we use in order to get out of our most our biggest miseries. And then we have to use it again and again. We have to try to find a new way of getting out of misery. Or we also use it in order to get what we want. But it has no bearing on insight. Absolute truth means insight, that we have, that it's true for everyone. Always. Now here we have again the reflection as belonging to this eighth step of insight. It is passion or equanimity. And this is called conformity knowledge. It's just a name. By checking up on our insight, we stabilize them. Now the same as with the jhanas. By recapitulating what we have done and doing it again, we stabilize them. And the mind is always able to go there. Now the same with insight. By checking up what the insight is that we have, bringing it back into mind, we make it stable so that, after having done that several times, we are actually have it on hand every time we need it. So instead of getting worried, unhappy, upset, angry, disliking, wanting, craving, attached, clinging, we can see it's impermanent. Immediately, not when somebody tells us, like in a meditation course, outside of a meditation course, always. But we have to stabilize. We have to stabilize these insights. It is the same as learning a new skill and not being satisfied with just doing it once because the skill is still very wobbly, but practicing again and again and again. Insight is a skill. A mind which is not Full of emotion, any mind that's not full of emotion can do it. It's a skill. And that kind of skill has to be stabilized. We have to reflect, recapitulate, what did I actually realize about impermanence, about dukkha, about sense contact, about cause and effect, whatever it may be, about dissolving the solution, about arising and ceasing, any of them, and bring it to mind so that it's always there. Another thing which is part of this conformity knowledge is to see those insights and see how they all connect with each other and make a whole. It's not separate. 
mindfulness of the body is not separate from impermanence and the elements are not separate from dukkha all of it is connected and that means using one's intelligent mind to grasp the Dhamma to the point where it is a living truth within one's own heart and mind and when it becomes a living truth within one's own heart and mind then one has become the Dhamma and none of those things in the world have any real impact the impact they have is because we don't see the absolute truth we, we see relative truth on, on the relative basis there's all these different people and there's love and hate and like and dislike and not wanting and wanting of all this stuff on the relative truth but none of it has any real significance it just has this aspect of being a continually passing show that's all but we need to recapitulate or renew this any insight we've had so that it becomes a reality within the uh, dispassion or equanimity is the very last step of insight everything after that is geared towards liberation path moment and we will talk about it eventually but because we need all these insights we need to be aware of our reference points now the reference point for any of this for anicca, dukkha, anatta can be the meditation subject the breath the jhana how is jhana dukkha? because it's anicca how is anatta? because with atta you can't get in it's very simple one's got to put the reference points together and see it as one whole of a complete turnaround of worldly opinion the worldly viewpoints have no bearing on this anymore we've long gone past them anything to do with the world no longer has any place in any of this having come as far as this I mean in the explanation doesn't necessarily mean we have come as far as that in our own practice but in the explanation there is no worldly thing in, in this anymore whatever there is in the world that we like and we dislike is long past seeing it like that will help us on any step of insight whether whichever one we are looking at so anicca dukkanatta can be in the meditation subject it can be in the thought can be in the movement of the foot it can be in anything and it's got to be seen and if it isn't seen it needs to be inquired into maybe why can't I see this why can't I see anicca in the movement of my foot well maybe that's too easy huh? maybe everybody can see that or and why can't I see anatta because I think that I am walking so that is the beginning of an inquiry into why do I think I'm walking if that's where the inquiry stops well that's it every answer one gets one gets is a new question and this kind of questioning should have 
a great deal of interest in it because we are always interested in people so why not being interested in ourselves it's the most important thing we could possibly be interested in if we have any kind of understanding that the Buddha might have said the truth we need to inquire where is this me that thinks it's walking and then maybe one finds that the mind is saying it and that the body is doing it and then trying to find within those two actions that which says me and then maybe finding also that whenever there is dukkha who generated it? who generated the dukkha? there's only one possible answer to that one me so do I want to get out of dukkha that's another question do I or don't I well and who's generating it how do I generate it all of this or anything else it doesn't matter whenever the answer comes up that has anything to do with impermanence with dukkha or with impermanence substancelessness that is an insight so we can use anything to inquire into we can use the cause and effect that we can see in the sense contacts we can see all the life that we've had so far and look at it and see who was having the problems and with that we have this conformity knowledge which means that we are have gained insight into the fact that nothing is worth being upset about that we have total equanimity and then we check up whether our insights conform to the 37 factors of enlightenment and to the Noble Eightfold Path now the 37 factors of enlightenment and the Noble Eightfold Path is part of that we have already talked about quite a number of them and they are important to know which ones are the factors of enlightenment because it will immediately tell us that these are of extreme importance I have mentioned the four supreme efforts there are four of the 37 factors of enlightenment anybody forgotten what they are or everybody know anybody forgotten <laughs> not to let an unwholesome thought arise which has not yet arisen not to let an unwholesome thought continue which has already arisen to make a wholesome thought arise which has not yet arisen to make a wholesome thought continue which has already arisen avoiding, overcoming developing, maintaining that's the four supreme efforts then we had the five spiritual faculties which develop into the five spiritual powers which are ten of the 37 factors of enlightenment okay, who's forgotten those? Bob? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the five spiritual faculties are those five horses that pull a wagon one is a lead horse and then two pairs lead horse is mindfulness and the two pairs are wisdom and faith and energy and concentration and first they are the five faculties which we all have and as we develop them they become the powers five spiritual powers so there we have those then we have the seven factors of enlightenment they are also included in the 37 factors of enlightenment 
And they were mentioned when we were talking about the um, corruptions of insight, the imperfections of insight. And again, this starts out with mindfulness. That's the first one, to be really attentive. And the second one of them is the investigation into phenomena, which is insight, the, the insight path, this investigation that we're talking about here. All these different steps of investigating all the phenomena that we've come into contact with, which is the second step. And then come the, uh, then comes energy. Energy is the third one. And that's mental energy, of course. And then come the uh, four aspects of the first four jhanas. And in the seven factors of enlightenment, they're called um, piti, rapture, or delight, and then uh, joy, calm, and uh, equanimity. So we have three factors. Two are supportive factors. Mindfulness and energy are supportive factors. And investigation into dhammas is insight. And then we have the four factors of the first four jhanas. So these are the seven factors of enlightenment, which also... And then we have the four foundations of mindfulness. Body, feeling, thought, and content of thought. Then we have what I haven't talked about yet, the Noble Eightfold Path, and the well, here they're called four right endeavors, but they're usually called four pathways to power. The idipada, the four pathways to power. And these four pathways to power are very important. I'll explain those. Now, most of these 37 factors of enlightenment, we have already um, had some explanation the uh, supreme efforts, the spiritual faculties, spiritual powers, and the four foundations of mindfulness, seven factors of enlightenment we have had plenty of explanation for, the jhanas and the insight part. And now the four idipada, the four pathways to power, they are actually sort of a short version of the most important aspect of the whole of our practice, like a telegram star. And the first two are again the supporting factors. And they're called concentration of, all four are for called concentration of. It means that we have to concentrate in the first instance, our intention. What do we really want to do? What is our intention? And this is why I have often said, make it a determination at the beginning of meditation, what you want to do. Do you want to become concentrated? Do you want to, do you want to get into the jhanas? Do you want to let give self-surrender? Do you want to let go? Or do you want to sit there and stay with the misery you've always had? Or what do you want to do? <laughs> <laughs> so, intention. What's the intention? Do I want to become rich and famous? Or do I want to become enlightened? It's, a, it's, it's as simple as that. <laughs> Whether one can do either one or the other is not the question. What's my intention? The interesting part of this is that, and you may check, you may be able to check that in your own life. What one really wants, one gets. If the intention is strong and one remains one pointed enough. If one really knows this is it. It's unfortunate that we often want the wrong things. And we get them, of course. 
and then we forget that that's exactly what we wanted because it doesn't work out then we think oh either one must have been a mistake or somebody else talked us into it but actually we act wanted exactly that so the only thing that is important here about the concentration of intention that we have already enough insight and understanding to know what we really intend what's our intention and when one has one pointed intention you can be sure we get it any intelligent mind can get it if that wasn't so the buddha would have wasted 45 years of his life he was teaching people just like us and i'm sure they had the same hang ups why shouldn't they what has what has changed nothing only the technology so the um if we have the intention to get out of dukkha not by getting something but by letting go then that will be our impetus we will have a kind of like a an arrow we are shooting off an arrow in the right direction and with that impetus in the mind we will keep going in that direction but nobody can do it for us we've got to do the whole thing ourselves and while there is a great deal of compassion in the buddha's teaching for anyone who doesn't have the right intention there is nothing one can do about it for somebody else either it's there or it isn't either we really want to get out of our, out of our dukkha or we want to be sorry for ourselves we really have only those two choices we could be sorry for ourselves or we get out now the second supporting factor is the concentration of energy now that means how much energy are we going to invest in order to make that intention come true how much energy means also how much time now obviously in a 30 day course we are investing a lot of energy and a lot of time but are we remaining clear on our intention the very important question what is my intention what do i really want out of life and we only have while there is of course rebirth consciousness but this person whom we are calling me at this point in time only has this one life and having only this one life we only have this one day and having only this one day we only have this one moment what do i want out of it what do i really want out of it do i want to wallow in dukkha or do i want to wallow in sukha which is just as impermanent or do i really want to get out and see the truth and am i able to keep my intention and energy one pointed enough these are the two supporting factors and because this is called the pathways to power they certainly do not mean power over anything or anyone they mean power over our own instincts and impulses and over our own um procrastinations and becoming powerful in our own being so that this power will then take us all the way and the other two are again calm and insight the first one is called consciousness and the second one is called investigation concentration of consciousness concentration of investigation so what's concentration of consciousness well the jhanas of course when our consciousness is concentrated that's where it goes the jhanas by the way are the only way the mind can go when it becomes concentrated we can stop that concentration by putting it on something else but if we allow it to be concentrated the, the consciousness the mind 
then it will go that way. The translation concentration of consciousness is a little bit misleading. The word which is used is shitta, which means mind. So I don't know why it's translated as consciousness. It's always that translated like that. But the word shitta is mind. So what it really means is concentration of mind. So what it means is that we get the mind concentrated. It's as simple as that. The whole of the teaching is very often to be seen as a jigsaw puzzle with a lot of little bits and pieces. But they make one big picture. If they don't, then we have to find a few more of those jigsaw puzzles to stick in so that we can get the picture. And the picture is us. It's our own photo. That's all it is. <coughs> because we are this. So, the concentration of mind, I think it would be much better to say that, because the word consciousness is used for two other purposes, and it's always the same word. It's used for the sense consciousness, vinyana, for the first step of the four mind aggregates, and it's used for rebirth consciousness. Oh, and third thing is it's used for, of course, the uh, sixth jhana, infinity of consciousness. So we'll better use mind here, concentration of mind. So with the concentration of mind, we have, again, that ability to have different levels of consciousness. As the mind becomes concentrated, we touch upon totally different levels of consciousness which show us quite clearly that that what we are thinking and experiencing in our daily activities and daily lives is not all there is in a human mind. And as we see that, we have an enormous support system for our investigation. Now these four are sort of like a blueprint uh, in telegram style of what we need to do. And they are four, four of the 37 factors of enlightenment. And energy, as you can see, was also one of the seven factors of enlightenment. It was also one of the five spiritual factors and the five faculties and five spiritual powers. So energy cannot be underrated and needs to be seen as a very important aspect, mental energy. Emotionalism speaks against mental energy, but the worst user of energy is negativity. The more we are negative, the less mental energy. And every negativity uses up mental energy to the point where if it becomes, goes overboard, inside is impossible. Because it doesn't allow any of this um, important factor of the mind to remain for the important activity of insight. So energy is mentioned so many times. Intention is only mentioned one more time, namely in the Noble Eightfold Path as a second step. I'll talk about the Noble Eightfold Path also, but not now. And concentration of mind, well, that's what the whole meditation is about, isn't it? And investigation, well, this is what we've been doing going through the stages of insight. The, um, the second factor of the seven factors of enlightenment is also investigation. Now, again, that may, maybe there is that um, difficulty again of thinking. The Buddha's instructions are the right kind of intention, the right kind of investigation. And when the right kind of investigation can be explained like this, that we watch that which is happening within us anyway. We are breathing, 
we're thinking, we're sitting, we're walking, all these things. And see that with an investigating mind. Does that comply with impermanence? Does that comply with dukkha? Does that comply with nobody there? What does it comply with? So it is an understanding of the personal experience which we're having from morning to night, year after year, decade after decade, life after life. Thinking, feeling, moving, breathing, heartbeat, walking, life after life. Always we have it. Day after day, moment after moment. Investigating means knowing all of these things or one of them as having one or all three of those characteristics. So it doesn't mean an abstract investigation into the fact that, well, yes, everything's impermanent and, um, you know, everybody dies. So, what difference does that make? Everything's impermanent, everybody dies. That really doesn't mean much, does it? We've always known that. Nobody can get away from knowing that. It doesn't make the slightest bit of difference to anybody. But seeing it happening within, moment after moment, that should make a difference. And if it doesn't, we'll have to try again. Investigation is a very particular way of using one's mind. You could even compare it to being a detective. If you've ever read detective stories, have you? I have. Love them. <laughs> you know what happens. The facts are there. And they stare you in the face. And yet you don't know who did it. So patiently and painstakingly, the clever detective has to investigate each of those facts to see what it tells them. And eventually, it has a whole picture, it tells them who did it. It's the same here. The facts are all there. We are constantly the proponents of these facts. We are Anicca Dukkanatta. We are showing them, having them all the time. The facts are there. So now you can be the detective and find where is this person in all this that thinks, this is me, having all these problems, having all these wishes, having all these memories, having all these things happening. Where is that person? Find it. Find the culprit, because that is the one who did it. That me, that's the one who's done it all the time. He's the only one that's always making trouble. He's the one that's killing all the joy. It's a real criminal, actually, because you can't really, with that inside of you, you can't really have complete peace, one can't have complete uh, joy, one can't have com constant equanimity, because it's always coming up and wanting something. So, investigation means being a detective. And the facts, you don't have to look for, they're there. But to make the connections, that's what the clever detective can do. And the more that is happening in a detective story, the more interesting it is. So write your own detective story. I'll talk about the Noble Eightfold Pass tomorrow. It's part of the the conformity knowledge, it's part of the uh, 37 factors of enlightenment. 
it's certainly part of the hub of the teaching and um, although a lot of it is already known so having explained some of the uh, most of these other aspects I'll still bring it into focus the uh, conformity knowledge is where we actually make the connections where we bring it all together where all the insights which have happened make one whole then it's sort of the um, last chapter of the detective story where all comes together and you can already see what well, must be that one okay All right, any questions? Yes. Uh, so basically the, all the steps leading up to the conformity are like collecting the facts, getting the facts at hand or actually at mind or at heart so that they're available. So that yeah, they're that's, no, I was using the word facts uh, in a little different meaning. I meant with facts is that all this what's happening within us is there, like the breathing is there and the heartbeat is there and the thoughts are there and the feelings are there and the reactions are there, all that's there. And now we need to see the three characteristics in them. Right, but that's what I meant. That yeah. the, the facts would be the three characteristics and everything that's come yeah. along with the cause and effect that we've seen with the rising and ceasing to solutions and so forth. Right. And then the conformity knowledge brings it all together, it's puts it all together, connects it all together. Right. Yeah. And then you then you can check that out by taking a step and seeing whether in the taking that step you can see all three characteristics. Mm -hmm. Check it out. <laughs> okay. Anything else? Well, they're, they're practice path. They're a practice. Um, you see, that's all, yes, in, in fact, that's not, a, not uninteresting because that has also given rise to the mistaken idea that they're not necessary because they're not mentioned in the 37 factors of enlightenment. And so in certain traditions, they're not practiced. Um, but one could also say that um, equanimity encompasses love and compassion. It certainly does. Uh, please put your attention on the breath for just a few moments. become aware of the fact that the only function of your heart is to love and then fill your heart with the warmth of love without attachment and the care and concern without expecting results that these feelings be the only ones within you
fill and embrace yourself with this warmth and care This creates within you a feeling of contentment and happiness. Now reach out with the warmth and care contained in your heart to someone where you find it easy to love. Give that person all that your heart contains not expecting a return. Not wanting to have or to keep. Only giving.
feel the self-surrender when you freely give warmth and care and love. And now pick a person towards whom you feel fairly indifferent. And let your heart fulfill its only function again, loving, caring, giving, without wanting to get. And now pick a person you don't like very much. And again let your heart fulfill its only function. Caring, loving and giving. See how your heart can do it if your mind doesn't interfere. Think of anyone who would benefit from being loved by you. And let your heart fulfill its function of loving and caring and giving warmth, nurturing without attachment without expectation.
think of people you know anyone at all one after another letting your heart do the only work that it is made for loving and caring and giving reach out to each one of these people embracing each one letting the mind subside letting the heart do its work Imagine you're standing right in the middle of this globe of ours and your heart full of love, warmth and caring is reaching out in all directions. Letting its contents flow out to beings everywhere Put your attention back on yourself. And feel the contentment and the happiness that comes from giving without expectation. It comes from loving <clears throat> without detachment. Let the contentment and the happiness fill you, surround you. Be everywhere within you.
male beings find happiness and contentment.